Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Hello team, thanks for joining us for episode 4 of Whelm, The Young Justice Files, season 2. Welcome to the cave, my name is Rich and I am here with my not-a-sidekick, Emily. Hey everybody. Uh, as many of you know, Caleb has graduated to the Justice League proper we keep hoping to get him on the show from time to time, but the league just has him so busy and we haven't been able to arrange times for all three of us. And D- just I, calm just... down, Rich. <sighs> Rich, just calm down. Every mission okay. takes an unexpected turn. We recover and adapt. That's rule number one. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I'm glad you're here. If you would like <laughs> to get in touch with us, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files. It's not as funny when you laugh. On Facebook at Crashing the Mode. <laughs> Maybe it is. I'm awful, on our website. We all know. <laughs> on our website, crashingthemode.com, on Tumblr at theyjfiles.tumblr.com, and at our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. And with uh, that housekeeping out of the way, let's dive in. The other Boom Tube hotspots have all been busts, but with this much security, must be guarding some big deal alien stuff, right? Our job is to find out. Bad girl, take the north hangar. I'll take the south. B, the middle. Wonder girl, hold position. What? Wait, why can't I go in? Cause you're wonder girl, honey. Not stealther girl. I can do this! No one's knocking your enthusiasm, Cass. And if we were in a firefight, there's no one I'd rather have beside me. But we're trying to avoid a fight. And we need to look out. Use the psychic link only. The Bialians have the tech to intercept our radios. Anything goes wrong, we scatter and meet at the rendezvous point. Clear? Clear. Clear. (sighs) Clear. (gasps) I mean, clear. Hello, Megan. The title for this week's episode is Beneath. The release date was May 26th, 2012, and that's just one week after the previous episode, which premiered on May 19th, 2012. The episode date is February 18th through 20th. The director was Doug Murphy, and the writer was Brandon Vietti, co-creator of the show. Nice. We had uh, some pretty cool guest voices, actually, this week, too. Robert Beltran does the voice of Maurice. He is best known for Star Trek Voyager as Chakotay. Irene Bedard did the voice of of, uh, Ty's mother, Shelley, Long Shadow, and she did the voice of Pocahontas, actually. And then Michael Horse, which uh, we were just talking about before the show. It's kind of funny. He did the voice of Hollis Longshadow, but he was also on uh, Twin Peaks. He was, uh, I think, was it Tommy? I think was his character's name. What was the reason why it was funny is because my wife is literally in the other room watching Twin Peaks right now. She never saw it on the way uh, on the original. It was Deputy Chief Tommy Hawk Hill. So a little quinky dink there. But he also did the voice uh, on Gargoyles of Aliza Maza's uh, brother. And and her dad, I think. I don't think it, her dad had had many lines, but there were a few episodes with her brother in it. So that's really cool. Just in time for your next mission. In our pre-credits scene, we open up with a friend of Jaime's, Ty Longshadow, we eventually find out, skateboarding to a bus station to run away to Houston. Jaime flies to the station to try and stop his friend, but by the time Jaime gets there, Ty is gone. Unfortunately, he did not get on the bus but he had been instead kidnapped by some mysterious person in an alleyway. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> yes. So in our post credit scene, we cut over to the bio ship where Bumblebee, Miss Martian, Batgirl, and Wonder Girl are headed to Bialia to try to find more information on the mysterious bomb that blew up on Molina Island a few episodes ago. According to Nightwing, boom tube activity has increased significantly in the country, and since the bomb was likely of alien origin, it seems like the best place to start. Yeah. Back in El Paso, uh, Jaime continues his search for Ty. According to the ticket guy at the bus depot, no one got on that bus to Houston, so Jaime knows now that uh, something happened to Ty, and he's worried. He learns from Ty's mother that Ty and her boyfriend, Maurice, got in a another, quote-unquote, another argument, potentially violent, which is why Ty ran away. Uh, You know what I found really interesting was Maurice said that, they both said that that he didn't lay a hand on Ty, but Ty has a Band-Aid on. Did you see that on his face in that first scene? Yeah. So, makes me wonder. Anyway, 
His uh, Ty's mom suggests that Jaime look at his grandfather's house. Back over in Bialia, the Alpha Squad has already checked several locations but found nothing about the bomb. One set of warehouses, though, has heightened security, including superhumans. While Miss Martian, Bumblebee, and Batgirl get to scout out the facility, Wonder Girl sees Simon arrive on the scene because she has been left on watch duty, basically. Earlier in the episode, they had been told by Nightwing that Simon was still in a coma from the last time he ran into McGann, but that's clearly not the case anymore. He's he's up and walking about. Which is bonkers. He's been in a coma for four and a half years or something crazy. Yeah. Speaking as a medical professional, that's not good. (laughs) I'm just saying. All right. So Wonder Girl knows. Speaking as not a medical professional, (laughs) that's not good. (laughs) That's how not good it is. Yes. (laughs) Not ideal. Wonder Girl knows that she can't call out to the rest of the Alpha team via the mind link because Simon's there and they already said that their radios either could have been hacked or may have been picked up or were already scrambled. I can't remember. She can't use regular means to communicate with them, so she decides to warn Miss M in person. She manages to get into the warehouse without being seen and warns Miss M, who shuts down the psychic link and hopes that Alpha Squad will follow the plan and return to the rendezvous point. Unfortunately, on her way out, Wonder Girl is noticed by devastation and grabbed. Back in El Paso, Jaime visits Ty's grandfather, Hollis Longshadow, and Mr. Longshadow reveals that Ty is actually a descendant of a long line of Mescalero Apache chiefs, who Maurice is jealous of. He also implies that he knows about Jaime's inner demon, and that Ty has a destiny tied to Jaime's. Yeah. So that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that a little bit in my Feel in the Aster, for sure. Back in Bialia, Wonder Girl manages to escape from Devastation and Icicle Jr. and more, while Batgirl and Bumblebee discover a huge underground ruin beneath the facility. The ruin is covered in ancient hieroglyphs, as well as being filled with numerous pods that have kidnapped teenagers in them, and an airstrip, which I can't even imagine how they built that, actually. Uh, Batgirl is knocked unconscious by Simon and potted while Bumblebee manages to go without being seen. Jaime, now believing that Maurice is jealous of Ty's pending chief status, faces Maurice in his backyard. Jaime thinks that Maurice may have locked Ty in a shed, as you do. As uh, one but does. when he breaks in <laughs> Yeah. That's totally a reasonable assumption. Sure. But when he breaks in, he instead finds boxes of pirated DVDs and video games. Not a teenager. <laughs> Uh, Maurice has no idea where Ty is, which leaves Jaime even more confused. Yeah. Meanwhile, back in Bialia, uh, B meets up with Miss M and Wonder Girl at the rendezvous point and tells them that Batgirl has been captured. The three of them manage to, uh, well, sorry, B has a plan. I was going to say the three made a plan, but B had a plan because she's <laughs> awesome. And they manage to free Batgirl, sneak back in, free Batgirl, and escape with a plane load of kidnapped teenagers. Then, back in the cave, we find out from Nightwing that Simon had planted mental illusions in the minds of his caretakers, making them believe that he was still in a coma for the past several months. <laughs> we find out from Miss M, who had read Shimmer's mind earlier in the episode, that the kidnapped victims were mostly runaways and were going to be delivered to a mysterious partner down the line. Nightwing congratulates the team on a successful mission, and everything seems like it's going to be just fine until we cut back to the compound in Bialia, where Queen Bee reveals that they've already collected another shipment of abductees, one that includes Tai Longshadow. Now now you can do the dramatic music. <laughs> dun dun dun. There's a lot of dun 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 in this episode. Oh, there's a lot to love about this episode. Let's do it. Yes. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. Okay, so Ty Longshadow and his grandfather, Hollis Longshadow, says that he's from a long line of Mescalero Apache chiefs. Well, for those people who remember the Super Friends cartoon from the 70s and the 80s, Apache chief was (laughs) one of their... Pretty bad cookie cutter stamp out attempts at diversity from the 70s and 80s. Nice that they tried, but the character's name was literally Apache Chief. And he just grew 
to enormous sizes. Like, he would grow to the size of the Earth and, like, punch away asteroids and craziness because it was Super Friends in the 70s. So all of these nods are like, oh, my gosh, are they going to do a are they going to do Apache Chief? And they did a, uh, in the Justice League Unlimited, they had an episode called The Ultramen, and they made a nod to a bunch of the characters from the Super Friends show, including Apache Chief. They just called him Long Shadow. So if you've seen those things, those are some pretty big nods in here, which is always cool when they do some reinvention of those, and we'll talk a little bit more, more about that about um, in, that, in Crashing the Mode. But there's a bunch of little stuff in here that I actually really loved. I've, talked, I've said before about Jaime and how I wasn't really a big fan of this Blue Beetle when he was first announced in the comics. So I didn't really follow him much. But this episode, where it starts this episode, this is really where I started like really warming up to him. We get a whole episode of him just wanting to take care of his friend, you know? Like you see like this, the part of him that makes him a hero, right? And particularly, like, I think Eric Lopez and I touched on this as well when he came on the show to chat with us about the idea that Jaime's got a huge amount of power. And, you know, a lot of us, many of us, hopefully fewer than I think, but have had abusive people in our lives, you know? And what would we do if we had that the power of the scarab and you're going face-to-face or toe-to-toe with someone like Maurice, who you know is probably hurting your friend's mom, probably hurting your friend like you know would the world be better without this guy and would you give into the scarab and like there's a lot of pretty crazy questions going on and Jaime chooses to do good right you know he chooses not just to do good like to to I guess actively not do terrible things you know so I don't know but also we get a bunch of other stuff about Jaime. Like apparently he attends normal school. He's like passed out at midnight amongst his books, which is classic. Me. Yes. It was me back in the day too. Glad to say those days are over. But also, I know it sounds ridiculous, but he lives in a cute little neighborhood. They have this like one shot of his neighborhood. I was like, maybe it's because I'm an adult now with kids and had bought a house and that kind of thing. But I'm just like, oh man, his house is cool. I like his house. (laughs) It's ridiculous. Anyway, but I guess we also get some implications that maybe his parents don't know, but we're not really sure, actually. I mean, he takes off without telling him where he's going, but I guess that's not really that indicative of whether or not they know. And actually, I'm not sure whether his parents know in the comics or not, whether he's Blue Beetle or not. Do you know anything about, about him, Emily? Nope. Not a I'm thing. just I'm like quietly sitting here because I'm like, nope, I don't know more than you. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure either. I wish I so, wish I could be helpful, but no. Yeah, I have to I have to do some research on that too. Cause I'm not sure we even find out in this in this season whether or not his parents know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Anyway, those are some of the things that I that I had, at least about Jaime anyway. I had a few things about Jaime too that I kind of liked with his with his storyline in this episode. Yeah, dive in. Because there's one thing that stood out to me that's such a small little thing, but I really liked seeing Jaime use his powers for non-combat stuff in this episode. Like he creates oh, a key yeah. and unlocks a padlock, and right. it's such a simple thing, but yeah. it's like, oh, you can't you can do stuff like that. You don't just have to plasma cannon your way through literally every situation. Yeah. So I just thought that was cool getting to see him do something that was like different than flying around and stapling people to trees at every opportunity. Right. And it implies like it implies a lot about what little things yeah. the the armor can do, which is pretty cool. I'm wondering if what we'll see in a season three, maybe if we get a little bit more chance for him to do some non, you know, major battling. Yeah, definitely. I'd love to see more of that. And also because you were talking about Maurice and all of that earlier, looking back on this and like it's moments like that that always kind of make me forget that this was technically a kid's show. This this show was on on Saturday mornings. I watched this live on Saturday mornings and had that scene of a woman being terrified of her abusive boyfriend at like 10 a.m. on a Saturday and was like, this is weird. This is this is a weird tone to have this early in the morning. 
But at the same time, it emphasizes like the darker tone of this whole season. It's things like that, that it's not just aliens killing people. It's real world issues that you that the show acknowledges that a lot of other shows in this kind of genre wouldn't or don't. I just kind of wanted to point that out. Yeah. And, and, you know, I have a an an ex in law married to one of my siblings. Um, They got separated a very long time ago. That guy was a nightmare, to be perfectly honest. And the Maurice reminds me of him, which I think is why I relate so much to that idea of, oh my God, what, what? I mean, I was 11 or 12 when all this stuff was happening. And so I was a little kid. So I actually wasn't that much younger than Jaime, assuming Jaime's, what, 16? What would I have done if I had the powers of the scarab to, you know, to defend the the people I love. You know what I mean? Yeah, it just, it really kind of hit home. And also touches back on the stuff we talked about a lot in the first season, which was Young Justice doesn't pull that many punches. I mean, they definitely had some restrictions that were put on them. Yeah. But again, you've got like Superboy shields being addiction parallels. And, you know, Artemis clearly living in an abusive childhood, being raised by her dad. And like, just you know, rough stuff as subtle as this is. And we don't see, we don't actually see Maurice, you know, even swing at Jaime, which I think probably was something they probably couldn't show an adult, you know, beating up a high school kid or whatever. It's still things that other people can really relate to representation in an unfortunate way, you know, like, yeah, I can relate to that, which sucks, but yeah. Anyway, sorry. Didn't mean to get <laughs> this whole this whole season though, guys. Definitely has a lot of like really painful, serious, darker moments, you know. And without someone like, I mean, the the closest we get to Kid Flash's kind of comedy relief is Beast Boy, and he's not in every episode. And he even he has gut punching moments, you know, for his impulse poor life. Impulse a little bit too. Oh, impulse. You're right. Yeah, right. We're gonna talk about uh, impulse next episode. Uh, quite a bit. Oh, right. That's crashing the mode. I forget because it's I've been up <laughs> since 4 a.m. That's okay. I think that's okay. Fair to fair to at least mention that at this point. But um, there's a character they show up. Yeah, prepared. I can't I can't wait to dive into him. Actually, he's a he's a favorite of mine. So yeah, what else? What else jumped out at you? Let's talk about things that are a little lighter for a bit because there is also a lot of fun stuff in this episode with the all-female squad they are a very fun little mission to go on and i just want to say that i love the line that uh that wonder girl says that their their uh, goal for the mission is don't get caught or create an international incident (laughs) those are the only two goals (laughs) right right because they just they're like we're the stealth team that means things are going to explode no matter where we go, That's but we right. try not to let that happen. That's right. So that just amused me that they're aware. It's taken five years, but they're like, yeah, we do that a lot, don't we? Yeah. And you know what? I think you're going to get into this. I, I, I'm i almost positive you're going to get into this a little bit later too, but the idea that it sounds ridiculous in retrospect, but the idea that they have enough female characters of diverse yeah. enough power sets to be able yeah. to even practically put together a team. Like, yes. it sounds dumb that that, isn't, that even has to be said. But no, I mean, even if you look at the core Justice League, you only have a few, even in Young Justice, right? You've got Wonder Woman, you've got Hawk Girl, you've got Black Canary. Hawk Woman. Sorry, Hawkwoman. Thank you. I'm just Hawk- I'm just saying. <laughs> no, and it's true. It's true. In in Young Justice, they specifically have it be Hawkwoman, which I'm glad. But I grew up decades with Hawkgirl being her name, so I fall back on that. Sorry. So basically, there's three. Who am I missing? There's those three. Then season two, we get Zatanna and Rocket. Right. Exactly. That's not a very diverse team. Those three, like. You know, in this team, you've got so you've got McGann, so Master Infiltrator, of course. You got Batgirl, Master Infiltrator. You've got Bumblebee, like like those are like super stealthy. Master Infiltrator, <laughs> exactly. Three Master Infiltrators, and then you know, and then of course you know, uh, Karen, 
you know, being as brilliant as she is. And now we're, you know, seeing glimpses of tactical, right? And then on top of that, and then you've got Wonder Girl, who certainly is not, as they say, stealth or girl, but who is who clearly is their their full full powered backup. You know what I mean? Like full super powered, near and vulnerable, strong flying, you know, equivalent. So just the fact that they even have enough characters to create an all-female team that's diverse and effective is fantastic. And Incredible. I just want so much that doesn't more happen. It. it just that doesn't. Does not it happen. just doesn't happen. Yeah. I mean, just from a practical standpoint, you have to th- you have to throw guys in there from a practical standpoint just so you can get your skill sets covered, you know? And then I know it was kind of a throwaway joke in the show about the whole, you know, would you have felt the need to justify an all male squad? Right. And, you know, Nightwing as, as open as he is, he's just like, yeah, there's just no good answer to that. So I'm because, because she's right. If it was an all male squad, nobody would have said anything. It doesn't really even matter. And, and which makes me wonder like about that a little bit later. Okay, fine. We'll get all right. I'm going to let you dive into that because that was really uh, it, it both. It made me happy and bug me at the same time, like both. So we'll let you dive I into understand. that. I understand. I just don't want to get too ahead of ourselves so that I sound super repetitive later. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> And I love Batgirl. But, uh, I love getting to see Batgirl yes. do her thing. We don't get much of her like as a setup for her. I feel like in this season, they're just like Batgirl is here now. But I do like seeing her in action because it's like, oh, that that's what she can do. You never told us what she can do. She's just doing it. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's pretty cool in this episode. And she gets to do Robin's little signature move of disappearing when no one's looking. And yeah. I like that that's just a Bat family trait. That's just a thing. They all do it. Yeah, exactly. Lesson one with Batman is when no one looks, you just disappear. disappear. <laughs> it's the most useful move. Let's see what else we got. We got it. I love everything with the female team in this episode, but I love that we get to see like there was something that I went back and rewatched like three times to make sure I was actually getting everything in it. There is a less than 10 second scene in which Miss Martian uses five of her powers in less than 10 seconds. Nice. And it's just kind of amazing to me. Like looking back on that and comparing that to stuff in season one where she's like, I can't really mimic boys well and then it's like five years later and she just rapid fire does everything and i'm just i'm like you are more confident you are more competent and i am stunned so she so she not she knocks out she knocks out shimmer and she shape changes into shimmer and what else what else does she do she flies into the scene flazes through the floor to get to where shimmer is Shape shifts into Shimmer, knocks Shimmer out, and then moves Shimmer into a barrel with her mind. <laughs> and it's a 10 second scene. <laughs> and nice. I'm just like, what just happened? Nice. Yeah, so that's that awesome. So that is just amazing to see her use all of her powers yeah. kind of at once. I mean, clearly this whole episode is about, is also highlighting McGann as a leader, right? Yes. Like, I love we've talked that. about like, all, all the characters from season one being the seniors now. Five years of experience is not messing around. You know, everything is second nature to them now, which I love. Season one, there is a line from Calder where he's talking about how McGann can't be a leader because she's too eager to please. Um, oh, I only know yeah. that because I've been oh. re-listening to stuff for the Tumblr. No, that's a really good point. That line, and then you compare that to like her in season two where she is taking charge and she is telling people what they need to do because she is the most competent one on that team. She is going in there with five years of experience. Like Wonder Girl hasn't been doing this that long. Batgirl hasn't been doing it as long as her. None of them have been doing this as long as her. And she is able to just go in and be like, this is your job. This is my job. We all need to go to the places we need to be and we're going to get this done. So that's just amazing to see how much she's able to develop as a character. Yeah. And just take charge like that. So that's just really, really fulfilling to see when you're like, you've you've grown so much as a person. And and you get to see a, a, a wide range, too, of their experiences, right? 
Batgirl yes. knows what she's doing. She's been with the Bat family for clearly a little while, right? Bumblebee seems like she's competent, but she's kind of she seems still new at the superhero gig a little bit. That was my impression. I don't know what her timeline is, but then clearly, like Wonder Girl has not been Wonder Girl very long at all. We've already no. gotten hints to that. There's even a line from Devastation where like Devastation doesn't have any idea who she is. I'm like, oh, Wonder Girl is yeah. not like a public known hero yet. And the team is set up to be that way, right? That's one of yeah. the reasons why the team is still the team and the league is the league, right? Because they're like they're undercover people. But yeah, you would think that Devast- if she'd been around longer, Devastation would have probably run into her with Wonder Woman at some point. But yeah, I I I love it. But Cass, she's yeah, I love Cass. I love the way that they're <laughs> representing Cass and Wonder Girl in here as much as I. I miss the Donna Troy Wonder Girl and kind of still wish she had been in the first season. I really like Cassie and I like this range of personalities that they have on the team in general. I will say random fun fact, Donna Troy exists in this universe. They've just she never does. had her show up. Yeah, she's listed on the uh she's listed on the the designations on the YJ wiki, but they they don't have her as Wonder Girl. They skip her straight to Troya. Yeah. who is a character that she becomes after Wonder Girl. It's like her Nightwing equivalent to Robin. Um, I would love to see what they're doing with her. So I know she's around, but they just decided not to have her be Wonder Girl first, and that's okay with me. I just want to see what they're doing with Donna. Uh, speaking of all that, and speaking of McGann as a leader and everybody and all of their different levels of power, I love that in this, Ms. Martian is not only just a competent leader she's a very encouraging leader like even when cassie breaks orders she's still very much like no you did the right thing you had to break orders that's okay and she reassures her and tells her that what she did was okay and they talk about how she needs to adapt and that's great to see that miss martian isn't just go where i tell you to go she's also you went where i told you not to go but you needed to do that and that's okay And so seeing that and seeing all of that is great, especially because it ties back in at the very end of the episode. I love the scene that is just all of them having a group hug. Yeah. Because it's so refreshing to see because they have enough female characters to make an all-female team. They have enough female characters to have this sort of like friendship and mentorship between this older generation of female characters and Cassie, who's like 15 and it's adorable. And I just love that because you don't get to see that on superhero shows that much with women. You get to see that with Nightwing and Tim in the first episode of season two, but you don't get to see that with women in shows like this. It just doesn't happen because there's never enough women. And so having this of having women from different maturity levels and different amounts of experience they're able to do this great thing of just all of them being like yeah welcome to the team you're part of the team you're just as much a part of this team as us even if we've been doing it longer yeah and so that was just really touching well let's uh let's use that let's uh let's segue from that into our debrief because i know you're going to touch on some of that there too let's do it stick around class is in session so i get to do the debrief this week guys Rich is letting me do this. I have taken it away from him. I am in charge now. Goodbye, Rich. This is my podcast. (laughs) Oh! I'm joking. (laughs) Feel free to cut that out, Neil. I don't know what I'm saying. I've been (laughs) up too early. Don't cut that out, So, (laughs) Dueling, yelling at Neil to cut things out. So, this week, I get to do the Canary Debrief. Because this week... We are talking about women on this show and women in media in general, because whether you want to call it the presence of strong female characters, girl power or feminism, portraying women as people is important. Throughout both seasons, Young Justice does an amazing job of giving a diverse group of girls and women fully rounded personalities and strong narrative arcs. From McGann to Artemis to Zatanna to all of the amazing women added in season two, each gets to be a fully-fledged character rather than a token female, an emotionless powerhouse, or just another love interest. Lots of cartoons do girl power episodes, where a contrived conflict forces all of the female characters to work together and prove that they're just as strong as the boys. When done right, this can be empowering. The Kyoshi Warriors episode of Avatar is a great example, in my opinion. If you haven't seen that, check that out. 
But in a lot of cases, girl power episodes can go very wrong, implying that having multiple women around is only helpful in specific circumstances or that women who are strong and powerful are somehow special anomalies in these fantastical worlds. So when it came to Young Justice tackling this type of narrative, they took a different approach. Yes, there is an all-female team specifically because Queen Bee can control the minds of most men, but Batgirl points out how ridiculous it is to imply that something like that is the only reason a group of women could be sent on their own. Robin, Kid Flash, Aqualad, and Superboy teamed up for a full two episodes with no women in sight, and no one in universe thought that was odd that there wasn't a single girl in that group. So why should this squad be seen as any different? YJ never had to sit the audience down and remind them that the female characters were strong and capable because that point is seamlessly incorporated into the larger narrative of the show. They don't need to draw attention to it because it's already there. When you're writing your story, show, don't tell works for strong female characters too. It's fine to point out that your female characters are important and acknowledge that depending on the world your story is set in, they might face sexism or discrimination. But if you show through a character's words, actions, relationships, and motives that she is a full and complex person, because that's what being a strong female character really means, then you don't need to tell the audience that in a specific girl power scene or episode. Acknowledging sexism and having characters dismantle it within a narrative is important because it's a real issue. At the same time, showing a world in which your female characters are shown to be strong and powerful and capable and are thus accepted as those things without question can be an equally important narrative. Things like Avatar The Last Airbender, the new Wonder Woman movie, and of course, Young Justice, do an amazing job of striking a balance between those two narratives. Creating women who show, don't tell, that they're amazing, even in the face of the occasional sexist doubter. Strong, complex, incredible women are everywhere, and that should always be reflected in our fictional narratives. I love it. The new Wonder Woman movie was so good, too. We were talking yeah, about that. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it's a great movie across the board. That's all you need, you know? And these characters, just like you're talking about, there are definitely some other shows, definitely some other shows and other movies and things like that that they spend a lot of time talking about the female superhero being a big deal and not just letting them be heroes and not having to point anything out because they're just doing it, you know? I love it. Well, let's crash this mode. Yeah. Got some things to say. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about it. It's probably cut, but I started talking about these characters. So at the end of the episode, we see Ty in a pod, along with three other characters, who we later learn are Asami, Eduardo, and Virgil. And these four characters represent the, the four, again, as I mentioned earlier, for Ty, this kind of cookie-cutter attempt at diversity that they tried to do with the super friends in the 70s and the 80s uh, ty is uh, the apache chief character asami is a character representing a character who used to be called super samurai eduardo is the character of el dorado and i think it's his name eduardo dorado i think maybe is his last name and virgil represents the character of black vulcan so virgil of course becomes static shock who some of you know from the tv show the tv series that he had which was also a Milestone comic title, which is the same uh, subgroup company that uh, of DC that also brought us Rocket and Icon as well. El Dorado's power was teleportation. Black Vulcan's power was lightning. Super Samurai had the ability to turn invisible and to create like red tornado-like wind control powers. It was just this random weird ass- assortment of things. And none of these names had anything to do with their powers. It was like, oh, he's Japanese, so I guess he's a samurai. What? (laughs) El Dorado, people know that name. We'll just slap that on. Uh, What? (laughs) Anyway, it's nice to see them reimagined. And particularly with Ty, I had talked to 
Brandon Vietti and Greg Weissman and asked them who came up with the idea of Ty's powers not being him literally physically growing and having it be this spiritual astral body form. And it was Brandon who first came up with that. And I love that interpretation of what he can do. So many implications behind that. Unbelievable. I loved it. Yeah, so I I know, Emily, you had talked about, you had read the Marvel comics, you're a fan of the Marvel comics series, The Runaways, right? Which is, this also kind of echoes as well, in some ways. They're not, isn't in the, I haven't actually read The Runaways yet, but I've heard it's really good. Aren't they like the the kids of like villains or something like that? Is that what it is? Yes, they are uh, the children of some like kind of D-list supervillains in L.A., they find out their parents are supervillains and then they run away from home and form a superhero team because that's what you do when you're a teenager and you find out you have powers and that your parents are evil. Uh, and that's really you're fun. You rebel. <laughs> yeah. Nice. You rebel. That's about, that's kind of like the plot of the first like three volumes of Runaways. It's just like our parents are evil. So we're just doing stuff to make them annoyed. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> and it's fabulous. But so I, I obviously had seen these and was like, oh, I see what they're doing. They're echoing, you know, back to these characters from the Super Friends. But as a as a new watcher, to me, like they, they seem to come across great just as themselves. Do you know what I mean? Like they didn't feel yeah, forced. Yeah. No, I agree with you. Uh, they were all they were all pretty interesting. I remember when it first premiered, I kept trying to google them and figure out who they were supposed to be and <laughs> right. nothing was coming up because you know right they don't ever use the names that they used to use for this type of thing so i was like who's tai long shadow when google's like the kid on know. young justice i'm like yeah but who is he in dc comics google's like well, I, I don't know why, why yeah. would i know so that was all that was kind of a struggle i think the long shadow name was only first introduced in that justice league unlimited episode where they instead of calling him apache chief because that's a a stupid name they (laughs) called him long shadow which was seems much like a cooler name like it's still reflective of kind of a native american style name from certain from certain tribal traditions but wasn't just dumb right and i think they adapted that (laughs) in for this as well which i thought was appropriate and then black vulcan's weird too black vulcan they couldn't use they had just created black lightning uh, not long before the character of Black Vulcan showed up on Super Friends, but they couldn't use it for some reason because of some kind of licensing DC Comics didn't want them using it in the show for some reason. I don't know. It was really weird. So they created Black Vulcan, which makes no sense whatsoever. I have no idea what this was supposed to be. So that would have been even harder for you because Black Vulcan isn't even a character in the comics at all. You know. Yeah, but I did. I did grow up with Static Shock being around when that used to be on. Right. on Cartoon Network. So I knew of Static Shock. Like it was one of those things where it was before I was bothering to pay attention to superheroes, but I'm like there's a kid. He has lightning. He flies around on a trash can. That's about it. That's all I know. Right. <laughs> but when he showed up and once they're like he's he's Virgil, I'm like, "Oh, I know who he is. I know that much." Yeah. Right. <laughs> but the other characters I had nothing going in. Every time they said Asami's name, all I could think of was Legend of Korra. Because this was happening at the same time. I kept being like, you don't have a lightning glove. You don't drive a steampunk car. Who are you? (laughs) That's funny. Um, I didn't think about that. (laughs) This is how my mind was processing these characters. And it's nowhere near as interesting as all of the history. But Well, and also thinking about, we had talked about too, the fact that season three is called The Outsiders, right? Yes. And outsider like and they talk about like this is about metagene trafficking and all this kind of stuff the outsiders from the comics included you know uh, black lightning was one of those characters uh along with metamorpho and halo and katana and some other characters so i can see how they can kind of merge these all of these things together, like echoing to the and improving, thank goodness, the Super Friends things, also folding them into, you know, the Outsiders deal and the fact that they're all metagene, you know, experiments by the Reach. So I, I'm interested to see what happens there and how Roy might fit into it, how Nightwing, who kind of stepped away from everything at the end of season two, might fit into it. 
Yeah. You know, if, whether he's training them or that kind of thing. If we're And Red Arrow technically... Red Arrow also... I only know this because of the internet. Red Arrow apparently also stepped away from the league at the end of season two. Greg Wiseman's talked about it online that he apparently decided to step back from being a superhero to help raise his daughter, which is adorable. Aw. But I... Fun fact, so it might be interesting to see him kind of have to step back into being a hero, actually get I wonder, care for Leon. Yeah, I wonder now, I wonder if it would be interesting if if Red Arrow becomes like the mentor of Arsenal, which would be super weird, right, for the original Everyone Roy. is Roy. Everyone is Roy, yeah. We gotta, <laughs> we gotta run that game. Everyone is Roy. I also really liked that nod to kind of the shamanic vision of his grandfather like grasping like under he probably knows that ty has this power because it sounds like it's hereditary anyway but also like nodding to that he's seen things you know that have to do with jaime and other things like that i just love that little nod to i i don't know i love that little nod i spent a lot of time studying shamanic traditions and um i am a practitioner myself so i liked seeing seeing those things represented i also like that they got native american actors to play these parts a plus choices young justice a plus absolutely absolutely let's see what else do we crash the mode for in this episode let's see got oh my god the underground the chamber that everybody finds that crazy temple that they get to have Zatanna come in and just be amazing in. That scene is epic. Yeah, that that seed was buried deep because it's early in the season and yeah. it doesn't come back for another, God, what, what episode is this? Like it doesn't come back for at least another 10, 12 episodes or yeah. something. And how and why it worked and all that kind of stuff is very, very cool. I'm curious now, like, I don't know, is Beatles... So are there, do they have like the Superman vulnerability to magic? Like, mm, is that, that something that may come up later for the Beatles? Like, clearly they were able to shut down this technological device. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just re, re-picturing in my head that scene with Zatanna with her eyes glowing and the, the whole deal in that scene was so good. Anyway, it's so that was at my long pause. It is. I do want to throw out one thing that we didn't write down because it was in something else that I wrote and I just want to point it out. High school junior has the line where he tries to stab Miss Martian for breaking his heart in Bell Rev. And I appreciate one that they bring that back up and that they bring it up throughout the season. Like it comes up later when he gets to actually meet the real terror twins. And it just yeah. amuses me to no end that it's been five <laughs> years and high school junior just can't let it go. Yeah. So that just that line makes me laugh every time I watch this episode. So I just want to throw that out there. It's kind of crashing the mode. Terror twins show yeah. up again. <laughs> uh, then, of course, Jaime in this episode can't completely control the scarab, which is an interesting little detail to put in there when we see how that unfolds later. Yeah, I mean, he's you're right. I didn't think about it. I mean, because I was like, well, he couldn't control it earlier either, but it's not. But that wasn't really the case. The, the You're right, because the scarab was still doing what he was asking it to do. In the yeah. previous episodes, he was just arguing with it. In this one, it was literally like creating the plasma cannon. <laughs> and he was yes. like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So, yeah, you're right. That steps into a lot more Jeopardy level. Yeah. You have a, yeah. you have an artificial intelligence robot thing that wants to murder everyone and you can't always control it. That's right. a little scary. <laughs> a little scary. Yeah, which you're right, comes into play uh, quite a bit as we start to unfold who this mysterious um, partner is and whatnot. So, very cool. All right, cool. Well, I think we can we can call that mode successfully crashed. So let's uh, let's dive into a little fan service. Emily, you've got a fan service for us. Yes, I do because. I get to do all the fun things this week. <laughs> because this episode does have our amazing all-female squad, I wanted to feature another thing about a bunch of amazing female characters, which is the Fictional Females podcast. The podcast that brings fabulous fictional females to the forefront, because alliteration is fun. Wow. Every week. Uh, <laughs> I'm yeah. impressed you got that. I, I would have <laughs> totally stumbled on that one. <laughs> 
Oh, years of acting and tongue twisters as vocal warm-ups. I learned to say a lot of crazy things. So every week, Cheyenne and Diana discuss a different female character from a different show, movie, book, whatever it may be, and they dive into what makes that character interesting, the role she plays within her own narrative, and the role that her narrative plays in our larger world of stories. They discuss, they've discussed so many amazing characters in detail over the course of their show. And when it comes to DC, since we do focus on those, they've already covered both Wonder Woman and Harley Quinn. And by the time this episode comes out, my guest appearance where I got to talk about my favorite alien cheerleader, Miss Martian, will already be out. So you can go listen to them on iTunes or on their website, fictionalfemales.com to hear them talk about a ton of amazing characters from action movies to Disney cartoons to comics to everything in between. They are fantastic. Nice. Do they talk um, Do they talk exclusively about animation characters or are there live action characters as well? No, they've done, they do a little bit of everything. They've done characters, they've done characters from books, uh, which is when they did like oh, a nice. Dorothy from Wizard of Oz podcast one, at one point. They did one that, one of the first ones I listened to was they did the female characters from Repo the Genetic Opera, which is such a weird little cult musical that I was like, this is fantastic <laughs> that you're talking about this is. of all things. Nice. It's weird, but I kind of love it. So they do animation, they do live action, they do everything in between. So if there is a female character that you love, they have either already talked about her or you can tell them that they should talk about her and maybe they will because that's kind of what happened with Miss Martian. (laughs) Me and Rich online were like, have you guys watched Young Justice? And they're like, no, should we? We're like, yeah, you should should watch (laughs) Young Justice. Yes, you really should. And, and I said, did. and then, yes, and then please have Emily on the show to talk about her. <laughs> it would be fantastic. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, by the time this airs, this episode airs, uh, your episode will be up. So if you haven't heard it already, go check out Emily talking about Miss Martian we with had a lot the of hosts fun of Fictional about Female. our Martian gal. Yeah. And we'll have a link uh, in the show notes as always. Well, I think we can wrap up this mission and head out of the cave. Of course, the best way to support our show is with a five-star review on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. Please continue to hashtag keep binging YJ and hashtag buy YJ comics on Comixology. You can also now use hashtag Young Justice Outsiders when talking about season three. And if you want to help us get more episodes, more secret origins, actual play podcasts, and more please consider supporting us through Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you can help us do even more with the show while getting some great rewards for yourself. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our computer is voiced by Madison Ray. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.